Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Shapiro. I'm the Director of Analysis for Geopolitical Futures. Uh, this is our first podcast. We're hoping to do one each week with one of our analysts. And to start us off, we're joined by George Friedman, who is our, our chairman and founder. Thank you for joining us, George. Always a pleasure. So the thing that is on everyone's mind, uh, everybody is sick of talking about the Donald Trump administration, but nobody can stop talking about the Donald Trump administration. And it all is revolving right now around the Flynn affair. Um, you've written two articles this week about um, your thoughts on the Flynn affair. So for those who haven't read your articles, why don't you just lay out for them uh, your basic take on the situation as it stands now? Well, first, the idea that Flynn, having spoken to the Russian ambassador, did something wrong uh, really just isn't the way it works. Uh, prior to elections, uh, anybody can speak to anyone. Yes, there's a law called the Logan Act. It was passed in 1799, and no one was ever prosecuted under it. In the transition, uh, there's a kind of feeling that you should not speak to foreign powers, but every administration does, and it'd be irresponsible not to. Uh, the Reagan administration spoke extensively to the Iranians, and that might have been a problem. But in general, you don't want to have your first conversation with major powers uh, the day you take office. You want to have uh, things set. So this entire idea that there was something illegitimate in, um, in Flynn speaking to the Russian ambassador uh, is dubious. For one thing, Flynn knew that he made the phone call from the Dominican Republic. He knew that these calls by, to the Russian uh, ambassador were being captured by NSA. He knew that because he'd been the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. So certainly he wasn't trying to hide it. Uh, I think he just uh, didn't think it was illegitimate. And given past the record, I'm not sure that it was, unless there were things said in those conversations that were wholly inappropriate, and it's very hard to imagine that Flynn would have done that. Well, considering all that, what do you make of, of the suggestions that the CIA or, or another American intelligence agency leaked some of these things because they didn't like Flynn, because there was some sort of disagreement between the intelligence agencies and Flynn himself? I don't find it unbelievable. I mean, one of our problems of our intelligence agencies is they're much better fighting each other sometimes than they are with fighting foreign governments. Uh, this is Washington inside baseball. And uh, Flynn is not a Washington insider, so he could have been taken by surprise. So there's reason to believe, given what Trump said about the agency, given plans for downsizing the agency, that there are some people inside the agency that wanted to uh, embarrass the president and harm him. Uh, the problem of doing this, of course, is the president is still the president. Uh, he can still decide who's going to be working doing what, he has enormous power. So it's a very dangerous game to take on the president because after you've won your round, he can come back at you. So while somebody certainly leaked, uh, whether it was somebody who was authorized to do so by someone, whether it was someone who was unauthorized, I don't know. There is, however, the possibility of a very old and unpleasant aspect of Washington showing its head. Uh, the insider leak from uh, the agency. Turning aside from the inside baseball, if you're looking at this from Moscow's perspective, if you're Vladimir Putin and you've been watching all of this unfold, how do you interpret what's going on with the Flynn affair and what's going on in the Trump administration right now? Well, it, we really take two paths on that. If, as some of the people are asserting, uh, there had been long relations between the Russians, Trump, Flynn, and there was some sort of conspiracy underway intended to blackmail Flynn to put him in a position where he had to work with the Russians. In other words, if this was a Russian intelligence operation, it just blew up in the Russians' face. Uh, they lost Flynn, their man under this theory. Trump is not going to be in a position to be forthcoming on Russian affairs. And they have simply screwed up big time. If, as I think, this was not a Russian uh, operation, that this was simply a legitimate set of conversations taking place between an incoming administration and a major international power, uh, then the Russians are very happy. Uh, they have just seen the United States go through one of its periodic internal explosions 
that rendered uh, the entire administration vulnerable not only to ridicule, but to the inability to make decisions. I suspect that the second thing is true, that there was no Russian operation to compromise the president. Uh, This was the Russians being absolutely delighted that the internal affairs of the United States evolved in this direction, paralyzing things and embarrassing everyone. Even if we accept that latter explanation, though, wouldn't that limit the extent to which a Trump administration might try and cooperate more with Russia in the fight against the Islamic State or with what's going on in Syria, perhaps even formalizing some of the conflict in Ukraine? Well, it's not just that it might limit them. The motivation of Trump after seeing this chaos gone to deal with the Russians would necessarily decline. Look, somewhere in this, some Russians played some sort of games, whether with the elections or what have you. If I'm the American president, and Donald Trump is the American president, I'd be furious with the Russians, and whatever inclination I might have had at the beginning to be more forthcoming uh, would disappear. And in fact, over the past few weeks, uh, the Trump administration has announced that it's not in favor of getting rid of the sanctions on the Russians. Um, Mattis has made very clear statements about the importance of containing the Russians and supporting the Eastern Europeans. Uh, Nothing has gone in that way. But one of the interesting things about this administration so far is the noise and fury and tweets and attacks on uh, Trump and so on have very little to do with the kind of policies he's announced. Uh, For whatever else was said about China, he has acknowledged the two-China policy with the claim that uh, Japan the one China, should... The one-China oh, policy. The one-China policy. I'm sorry. In, <laughs> you got me. One-China policy. <laughs> uh, but on the other side, Japan, he had said, should have, get nuclear weapons. Now it's our very best ally. Uh, when we go through the entire list of foreign policy positions, they're pretty orthodox compared to, say, the Obama administration. So there's this division between the sound and fury... And what it signifies, which so far at least, it has much less significance than it appears. I agree with all that. But if we think in terms of, if we put aside the sound and fury, we can still say that Flynn represented a a vision of American foreign policy that saw Islam as the biggest threat to the United States and what's going on in the Middle East as the biggest threat. And Mattis obviously has a much more subtle and a much more expansive view of the threats that the United States faces. So when you look at this as an analyst, putting it all aside, Do you see it from Flynn's point of view, or do you see it more from Mattis's point of view? Well, here's the situation. We are operating militarily in the Middle East. The president has asked for a plan within a month for defeating ISIS. uh, And therefore, we are operationally at war in a region. And when you're at war in a region, that ought to take priority. In the long term, the stability of Russia, the condition of South China Sea, these may be greater issues, but we're not in conflict. So where Flynn was the advocate of the focus on the Islamic world, and Mattis has been the advocate of a broader view, Mattis has won that argument. But the reality is that if the president really wants to take out ISIS, he's going to be spending most of his time worrying about that and less time worried about the broader issues. Well, and just maybe to, to close, when I mean, you said that the you know uh, provocations in the South China Sea or instability in Russia take a back seat to places that you're militarily engaged, but we're beginning to see some signs of instability in Russia really taking hold. So do you think from the U.S. perspective now, aside from all of the strutting and all of the accusations about what Russia has actually done, how is the United States viewing what's going on in Russia itself and all of the internal shuffling that Putin is having to do right now? Well, where you speak of the United States viewing, there are a lot of people and they have a lot of little different views. My view uh, is that Russia is now beginning to experience the real pressures from the financial crisis that resulted from the meltdown in oil prices. We're seeing governors replaced. We're hearing reports of people not being paid. We're hearing about demonstrations. These are very early, but they're not very promising signs. When you step back and you look at the world from Putin's point of view, 
Uh, he carried out his operation in Syria. It achieved very little of strategic value to Russia, except demonstrating that they could carry out a small operation. The situation in Ukraine is pretty much static. And the economic situation in Russia is deteriorating at an alarming rate. So after all, again, the sound and fury is eliminated, the United States remains one quarter of the world's economy and the largest military force, and the Russians are a receding power. And like much of the games that intelligence organizations play back and forth and within their own countries, in the end, it just doesn't matter nearly as much as reality does. All right. I think we'll wrap it up there, but thank you, George, for joining us. And uh, for more on geopolitical futures, please visit us at www.geopoliticalfutures.com. And like I said, we'll try and put one of these out a week and always welcome people's feedback. Thanks. For more geopolitical insights from the team at Geopolitical Futures, sign up for our free weekly email newsletter using the link in the description.